Joining us now is Jeffrey Tucker. He's the president of the Brownstone Institute. You can follow him at Jeffrey A. Tucker on X. He's a friend of the show here on the Will Kane Show. We're glad to have him once again. What's up, Jeffrey? Uh, well, terrible things as always. <laughs> Terrible things. We got to be optimists, no. but we will work through some negativity here best that yeah. we can. I am interested well, in hearing your perspective on what happened in Georgia. Um, you know, for the details, young nursing student at the University of Georgia, 22 years old, goes for a run around the campus. She runs around a reservoir that's on campus. From what we know, she's attacked um, by what appears to be an illegal immigrant, and what I say appears to be because there was some question about confirming his status, and I think most of that is caught up in semantics or policy gray areas of whether or not he's claimed asylum, but it's uh, that, per- that process has been perverted and corrupted and distorted beyond recognition, so it's, in my mind, somewhat semantic. But um, she's murdered, uh, and we had former directors of the... Uh, uh, Customs and Border Patrol of Homeland Security on this weekend talking about there was at least three different opportunities, Jeffrey, where this could have been stopped. He he could have been denied entry at the point of entry, um, kept him in Mexico. He could have been kept in detention in Texas where he was released because of overcrowding. And he was arrested in New York at one point for an alleged crime. He wasn't ultimately charged, but he, he came into contact with the system at least three times and still remained free, free to commit crime in the United States. You're a uh, libertarian, I believe, is a fair description, Jeffrey. There is a debate within paleo populist libertarians about immigration and illegal immigration. I'm curious your thoughts on what happened in Georgia. The uh, What is happening right now should not be called immigration any more than the COVID rep- uh, response should be called public health. You know, we've got something completely different operating in this country. This is maybe goes best by the name anarcho-tyranny, which is to say no law enforcement for some and extreme law enforcement for others. Uh, The immigration system has been wildly abused over the last uh, several years, really, uh, as to become like an agent of of chaos. This is not immigration traditionally understood, as we've always favored and liked uh, for our entire history of, of this country. This is something else that's using demographics to manipulate political outcomes and introduce chaos. I've come to this conclusion very reluctantly because I've always been a big champion of of immigration, obviously, and I, I still am. But the strange thing is that legal immigration has never been more difficult and illegal immigration has never been uh, easier. And these these two realities are happening at the same time. And, you know, the crime problem is is an extension of this. You brought up demographic issues, uh, you know, on the left, it's often dismissed as, oh, are you going into the conspiracy of the great replacement theory? On the right, anecdotally, um, when I speak to some of my friends who are not as politically um, plugged in, they wonder, how does this mechanically swing elections? Of course, we know that the census is not, yeah. uh, does not limit itself to citizens, but it, it, it counts total head count. That right. would benefit anywhere there is an illegal head count in the United States, but that would seem to benefit not just places like New York, it would pl- benefit places like Texas. So what is the electoral play, if that's a motivation on the left, for allowing this unfettered illegal immigration? Well, you know, part of, part of it, I think, is, is, is just, as I mentioned, it's a, it's, it's a policy of chaos and, and how it's going to be used in the, in the future, we don't entirely know. But uh, as we know, what what happened after the COVID response, the lockdowns were really an important factor here. We saw a mass exodus from blue states to red, which would increase the electoral power of the red states and, and deny uh, the ruling class the electoral majority they would need to secure their reign forever. So allowing this, this vast immigration, you know, it does uh, introduce the possibility of manipulating census outcomes that also... And Elon Musk proved this, and I was shocked by it. Uh, there, there is a, a greater degree of liberality in the voting system to enable people to vote in elections, in state elections, local elections, and even federal elections under some conditions. So it, while it might be technically true that you have to be a citizen to vote, it's a question of what is the standard you're going to be using for that? Like, how do you demonstrate that, especially on absentee uh, ballots? So if you can manipulate that, you know, the standard by which you you judge whether somebody is or is not a, a legal voter, 
then you can introduce potentially millions of people into the voter rolls that other actually don't belong there. So, you know, it, the devil's in the details of these kinds of cases. So I mentioned that you're a libertarian. I don't know. Libertarians love to divide themselves based upon philosophical preferences into so many different microcosms, uh, tribalism within libertarianism, paleo, populist, anarcho. I I don't know your particular brand of politics, Jeffrey, which you can tell us. But um, I want to say something. I want to describe for you something that I think for some odd reason has become controversial, but to me— is simply uh, historically consistent. In my mind, immigration policy should work with the following priorities. Closed borders, controlled immigration status, no illegal immigration, obviously at at the mercy of the ability for enforcement, but no illegal immigration and a a very strong deportation state uh, should you be caught as an illegal immigrant. Secondarily, legal immigration should be a process that factors in skill, merit, contribution to society, and the preservation of American culture. That is the controversial part that somehow I think is historically just grounded in fact. The the founders and then subsequent implementation of immigration policy in in the United States always thought about assimilation, Mm -hmm. always thought about bringing people in, their ability to assimilate, and in numbers that allowed them to assimilate into right. what is now also a controversial thing to say, a greater culture of the United States of America. Sure. That would be a sane immigration policy in my mind. How would you structure immigration? Mm, so what you just said, Will, just sounds like good uh, common sense, regardless of ideology. I think what you said is, 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 is absolutely true. And I look, I have to admit my own naivety about this in the past. I was a little bit of, you know, of a open the borders kind of person, but... But I, I've learned uh, that this is, you know, potentially very invasive of the rights and liberties of Americans, which, you know, we do have a government, we do have borders, and and their purpose is really to maximize the rights and liberties of of, of this the citizenry of that political commonwealth. This is, it should not be controversial. And American immigration policy has always been about that. You know, there was a great liberal policy in the 1880s, and that was tightened in 1923 in ways I, I don't think was was good. It was loosened again in, uh, in 1968 in ways that I, I, I think is kind of discriminatory. But anyway, as you say, there's, there's always been the issue of, of – how do you allow maximum uh, immigration and within the context of integrating yourself into our political community in ways that are not disturbing of of the aspirations of the Commonwealth? I mean, this this and, and there are various ways you can apply that, um, and there have been various ways in which that's been applied. But the way you don't the the the, the worst possible case for applying this is to <laughs> Make it almost impossible to to immigrate legally, which is it's much more difficult now than it used to be. At the same time, you just open the floodgates for for this invasive force, you know, with millions and millions and millions of people pouring in, getting on welfare, living in you know high end hotels in New York City like we have today. This, this is a policy designed for maximum civilization disturbance, maximum political upheaval. And the introduction of chaos. And I tell you this, Will, um, you know, the great thinker F.A. Hayek, for whom I think you have some affection, warned against this very policy. In the 1970s, he was asked about this sort of uh, huge increase of Islamic immigration to the U.K. And he said, well, while I'm in favor of, of immigration, I think, you know, the human being is an asset, uh, you don't. You have to be careful not to, to to introduce too many profound disturbances to the political yes. community that can cause a, a, a grotesque a reaction that can lead to authoritarianism and and cause people to uh, throw away essential rights and liberties in favor of doing something about what's perceived to be an invasion of an alien a mass alien force. And so he wrote this. In a letter, and I, that's what, when I read that letter, it began to, this was like about maybe, say, 10 years ago, I read this letter, and it made me stop and think, you know, I mean, I don't think anybody would accuse Hayek of not caring about about uh, liberty, right? But even he was warning that this can actually be profoundly disturbing to a, a political commonwealth 
And sure enough, here we are. We've gone through years of this very kind of thing in the United States, and, and it's going to permanently affect the demographics of our political community in this country. And, and oh, you know, I, I've, I've been very reluctant to come to this position. But but a, a responsible thinker, libertarian or not, really has to think about the long term implications of this, and they don't look good. Well, Hayek would be appalled at present day UK then. And and by the way, you yeah. Jeffrey, so there are many my favorite things about you. You're a man of contradictions. You, your patrician accent. You're certainly well learned and well read, and your bow tie, and yet you're dipping skull at the same time. But my favorite thing about you is that you uh, is your humility. I really, I really mean it. I love that. I'm learning. I'm changing. Is my favorite thing about you, Jeffrey Tucker. Um, you know. So I want want to move to this. Well, first of all, this will serve as a transition. This story is being reported on the mainstream media without with leaving the details out that this man was, you know, most likely an illegal immigrant. Sure. Um, it, it, and I mean, on one hand, why are we surprised? And to, to the to the moment that we're broadcasting right now, I don't think Joe Biden has made a statement about it. He may have. I, I, I want to have some humility about whether I missed it. But I mean, like, if this were a crime that fit, you know, as an anecdote into a policy that he wanted to champion, he would have been there immediately. A gun crime, a race crime, whatever it may be, it's, it's been 72 hours. We would have. And, and this is a crime tied to a policy, and we'd hear nothing, which just tells you everything you need to know about priorities and importance and, and reveals, I think, to some extent, the underlying policy. But back to the media uh, and how they're reporting it, I want to transition to the column you wrote where I do think this is fascinating. You wrote about Google. We've all been talking about Google's AI and how it's just turned reality into a woke reality, history into a woke history. And you talk about when they launched, their motto was do no evil, which if that were the end of the story, I agree with you, that would be like super weird. Like, why are you saying your motto is do no evil? I wasn't thinking about evil. So why are you telling me that your motto is do no evil? But what's even making it more weird is, as you wrote, in 2015, when they changed to alphabet, they dropped the motto do no evil. So that's really weird as well. So, oh, if you were saying it before, but you're not saying it now, what are you saying? <laughs> you know, it's the strangest thing. I remember uh, I remember those days when Google came along and, and that was their slogan. I remember thinking at the time, that that's a strange thing for a company to say. And I wrote in my article that if a donut shop opened down the street with the slogan, we won't poison you. You know that would already, uh, uh, you know, raise some <laughs> some some questions. I don't well, think I didn't want to go to that I didn't donut really shop. Understand this for a very long time, but Google was in fact established with a, a grant from the Defense Department or, or DARPA while these yes. guys were at Stanford University, and it's been up to no good for a very long time. And my friend Jay Bhattacharya wrote the other day on on X. He said, you know, I'm not sure when I exactly lost trust in Google's search engine, but it might have been around, say, 2017 or so. And that was about the time that I began to lo lose trust in it, too. But the last two weeks have been so enormously interesting with the announcement of Gemini, you know, the great AI program, and users went after it and started trying to generate images of founding fathers and Vikings and this kind of stuff and could not come up, could not get, get Gemini to, 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 to draw a picture of a white person. It was very strange. And since that time, it's just been one scandal after another. This AI program is it's it, it's 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 generating crazy results, smearing you know conservatives with fake bad book reviews of their books, and tra trashing Republicans and extolling the glories of Democrats. And the bias that you got doesn't quite describe it. But what's interesting about this is that it 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 seems like you know the the their artificial intelligence engine is so bad. But here's here's the key: it's not an anomaly. So. Right. What, yeah, what we're learning from their AI system is the truth about the algorithms behind Google itself. So it's it's kind of revealed the full truth about Google. This is very disturbing because Google actually has 96% of the search market, which is it, it, just a near monopoly on search, which means that everything that everybody's using it for is 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 wildly distorted. I mean, I, I run Brownstone Institute, which is now... I, not not even quite three years old. I look at at the way Google works, and I'm just amazed that we get any web traffic at all. 
I mean, it's so biased and so designed to manipulate the public mind, you know, at the behest probably of some very powerful people in government that they're working very closely together. I mean, I'm so sorry to report this because I, you know, I went for years thinking that Google was a, like a scrappy, wonderful, libertarian oriented tech company, you know, everybody just in favor of free information for everybody and free speech. That turns out not to be true. And that's generally not true of vast portions of big tech and vast portions of the, of, of the mainstream corporate media Today, both are involved in this kind of blob style uh, censorship program designed to manipulate cultural and political outcomes. It's so strange, Will, for, for me to hear myself say this, because I could tell you, I never, if somebody had said those words to me four years ago, I would have said, oh, you're one of those weird uh, conspiracy theorists. I don't think that way. I don't believe what you just said. And here I am saying that very same thing. But, you know, the evidence is nowadays overwhelming that I have lost trust in so many of the institutions that I I once believed in and 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 not be not because I've been converted to a new you know politics is because I've looked at the evidence the evidence is overwhelming you know our innocence is lost these days you're exactly right which I don't I don't think in, in, I don't think as many people as as should have treated this AI philosophical programming revelation as the revelation it is into the rest of Google. This isn't just about images. This is about the search that we all use and the results yeah. that we're getting, which help us understand reality. That same ideology is going to be right there in the algorithm of your search on Google. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's correct, right. And, and people have their, their cell phones, which is like, you know, their best friend in a way that never, you know, never leaves their pocket or their purse. But but both you know the Samsung and the iPhone are both set uh, to default to Google Search, which is a kind of setting that Google paid tens of billions of dollars to get from both these companies. And how many people? I mean, really, realistically, how many people know to go to their their preferences and their properties on the on the uh, browser that they're using on their on their smartphones and change it to something mm -hmm. else? I mean, I, I, it's got to be less less than fewer than one percent of users would even think to do that. So this is you know, sort of wired into our lives and people are just unaware of the extent of the manipulation of the way we think about reality. It's it's a very serious matter. And, and one of the things that always made us feel better, made me feel better, I don't know about you in the past when it comes to tech, is the idea that before Facebook, there was MySpace. You know, before Google, there was Yahoo. And what that made us believe is that the kid in his garage could disrupt the gigantic behemoth that perhaps has gotten corrupted. Right. But I'm not sure we can have faith in that future anymore. I don't know that there is a kid in the garage that can take down Facebook, that can take yeah. down Google. Not because we've lost genius, but because we've lost an even playing field. Uh, well, you said it very well. And thank you for, for saying that. I hadn't quite thought of it that way but you're exactly right we we came of age in the in a digital world where we thought it had even the playing field anybody with a good innovation could disrupt anything else yeah myspace went away facebook came along we thought facebook was going away google came along and disrupted you know the prevalent search engines we thought something better was coming so we we were convinced of this process what we had not anticipated and which i don't think we fully realized is the extent to which the, all these companies have become sort of state protected monopolies that are, are so woven into the core of our lives are going to be very difficult to disrupt and you know the patent system is is now uh, created a, a sort of a, a thicket a legal thicket for any disruptor that comes along the copyright systems and and also the extent to which um, the deep state is woven into the fabric of their operations you know when elon musk took over twitter uh, he said uh, well, he discovered that that many people working there were, in fact, you know, sort of um, moonlighting with the FBI. <laughs> Believe it, he said at yeah. some point, I don't care what your conspiracy theory is about Twitter 1.0, it's worse than you think, right? He said that. <laughs> kind of, you know, yeah. it makes the imagination so go wild. But this is the reality. And, you know, the Supreme Court is going to be looking into this uh, within the, the coming weeks. I think the date is March 18th. They're going to start hearing oral arguments about this. 
whether and to what extent government can use these third party uh, uh, institutions to manipulate the the press, whether it's major media or social media or tech companies, to in effect not just censor uh, uh, dissonant voices, but to push out you know a prevailing propaganda line that right. you know is loved by the CIA or FBI. So the the Supreme Court is going to have to deal with this, and and we're probably up to ten thousand pages worth of documents from Discovery showing that yeah the problem is real. And the Supreme Court absolutely needs to deal with it. We do have a First Amendment in this country, which is supposed to guarantee that the, 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 the way we speak, the information we get is not supposed to be so heavily manipulated by government agents to the point that you know we become like a Soviet-style system. And yet we're becoming that way. And the Supreme Court's going to weigh in on it. I, I hope that they decide the right way because if that decision goes the other direction. This is very early stages, by the way. They're going to be looking into an injunction that was passed uh, by the Fifth Circuit. And if, and if it doesn't go our way, it's going to give a free hand mm -hmm. to all these government agencies that have been you know, routinely manipulating uh, uh, information outcomes and, and public propaganda now for years. It's going to give them a free hand right. to continue doing this. And at that point, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to monitor the Supreme Court. Uh, cases, which begin, some of them begin, by the way, this week That's true. Uh, here on the Will Cain Show. Um, so last thing I want to hit with you, Jeffrey. Um, so you, you mentioned Brownstone Institute. You guys have an article up about central bank digital currencies. This is the idea that we'll all move to sort of a cryptocurrency that is controlled by the government. And the fear, I believe, is that it's, it, it, it is a is a direct path to a social credit system, government control over our monetary system, but also then the implementation of social behaviors as a way, um, as, a, as an enforcement mechanism to get us to do what, what, what they consider to be virtuous or the right behavior. So I just want to run this by you. Um, COVID taught us that human beings are motivated by fear. Perhaps secondarily to fear, human beings are motivated by the path of least resistance. We run like water. And we will do, we will trade away, we as a group, as a herd, will trade away privacy for convenience. We've done it over and over. We do it every day. We give away privacy every day for an easier life. And I'm wondering if we haven't already done so when it comes to the CBDC. See, I believe something like 70% of in-store and obviously online transactions at this point are credit card driven, Jeffrey. Very few people. Cash has taken on a much diminished role in society. Yeah. Um, our bank accounts, it's not as though we have safety deposit boxes full of cash. Our bank accounts are ones and zeros. They're computerized. They're all in a system. And to believe that the government doesn't know where all my money is or could find out as quickly as they desire is extremely naive. All you have to do is watch a crime documentary. Local police can figure it out in about 24 hours, much less the FBI or higher levels of the Department of Justice. And I'm just wondering, like, we've already done this in the name of convenience. We've already all traded away essentially privacy and, and, and into digital currency. What's the difference? Like, when they come along and they issue a CBDC, how does it actually change anyone's life um, – I know what the dystopian vision of it is, but in the short term, everybody's going to react with, are we already kind of doing this anyway with mm. Apple Pay and my bank and my credit card? Yeah. Okay. What's important here, Will, is that you were describing a situation where they can observe what you choose to do. Uh, under a CBDC, what they can do is direct what you can do with your money. So the money, the money itself becomes programmable. So this this unit of currency can be used for food. This can be used for housing. And if you use your food budget for your housing budget, it could be cut off. Okay, so the money becomes programmable and directable. That's that's a different level of of control. And of course, you can be shut off too, or you can be shut off for some things and not other things. So you 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 get a situation where the central masters can control how you use your your money. I mean. Here again, we're a little bit on this pathway right now with the tax system. You know, we have uh, health savings accounts that you can only use for certain purposes and other accounts you can only take out when you're 65 and that sort of thing. But this is very rudimentary. 
if you expand this to every element of your personal finances so that every aspect of your spending is directed, not just in terms of how you use the money, but when you use it too. So a certain amount of infusion of funds you get, you know, like you did during COVID, they dropped, you know, $4,000 into your bank account. If you can make that money expire by, say, the end of the year or the end of two years, uh, so that it becomes demonetized after a certain period of time. That's a different level of control. So it's not just what you use your money on, but when you can use it. That gives them full control over velocity of money, the rate at which mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it changes hands, which gives them new powers over monetary policy. And then, and then what you're using the money on. So you can sort of redirect the path of inflation. That's going up in price, that's going down in price based on the central central controls. It's absolutely dystopian, but it is possible now technologically to do this now. It's a question of how are they going to manage the transition to this? There's no question that this is the ambition, all right? So, and once again, this is another conspiracy theory that turns out to be true. If you had told me five years ago that I would be on this podcast saying this kind of stuff, I would have said about the now me, that man's insane. But all the documents are there. We, the executive orders are in place. There's no question the ambition is there. The only question is what is the transition mechanism they're going to get from our current dollar system, which is, as you say, heavily compromised, but nothing like what they imagine is possible. And they have every ambition to do it. Whether they're going to get away with it is another question. One thing I do like is that, first of all, that you're, you're having me on this podcast and you're talking about it. It was never the intention to make this a, a, a point of public controversy. Ron DeSantis has been very vocal against it. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, because he read Aaron Day's book, which is a, who's a fellow of Brownstone, also talked to Trump, and Trump made a big statement against CBDCs too. So it was never supposed to be a point of public controversy. The goal was just to do this turnkey solution, and we all just kind of went along with it. But now the word is getting out, and it's become a point of controversy, which I think might slow them down just a bit. So part of me recognizes the step, and it would, in theory, be a large step between adoption of CBDC mm -hmm. and then adoption of a policy of how to use CBDC to control behavior and spending. But the other part of me hears you, well, it's not a big step because they've already laid out their intentions and motivations, and then... Beyond that, logically, you'd say, when has the government ever granted themselves an ability or a power that they didn't ultimately avail themselves of? And you can even boil that down into more specific. When have they ever developed a weapon that wasn't eventually used? Every weapon is eventually used. So the adoption from the adoption step isn't that far from controlling behavior step when it comes to CBDC. Yeah, and All right, Jeffrey a, Tucker, a, a always financial great. Financial crisis or something, and they can move on this right away. Uh, the same thing with, yeah. with COVID, you know, uh, whether the crisis Emergency is real measure. or not, we know they can do it. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was Churchill that said, never let a great crisis go to waste. Jeffrey Tucker, um, thank you so much. Always love having you here on The Will Cain Show. Thank you so much, Will.